Hello, my friend, and welcome back to my channel. Okay, so today I have my mid-month wrap-up for May. Yay me! I read eight books, but don't get too excited because um, two of those were novellas, so they were really short, quick reads. I mean, like eight halfway through the month. That's a lot for me. So let's go ahead and get into it. So the first one I want to talk about is Forever Your Rogue. This is a historical romance. This is one of my favorite books of the year. I gave this six out of five stars. So I've only given, like, I don't even remember how many. I think I've only given like five or six books six stars this year. This book completely blew me away. I love it so much. This is an indie historical romance. It is a widow romance, a reformed rogue romance. There are children involved, which are it's just, I love, love, love when the widow has children and the hero comes in and wants to be a father to them. Like, I just love it so much. And I just, I just adored this. This was full of longing and romantic gestures, like very small details, like the brush of a hand thinking about her neck. And it just like, I loved it so freaking much. So the basic premise of this is Cora is recently widowed and her husband, it was not a love match. It was a marriage of, you know, not really convenience. It was a marriage of basically a good arrangement politically or financially or things like that. And she hoped that the marriage would grow to be a loving one and it never did. And her husband definitely uh, stepped out on her and had several mistresses, you know, breaking her heart, of course. So she devoted herself to her children, just threw herself into raising her children. So when her husband dies, she noticed that he actually left the children to his brother and sister, the brother-in-law and sister, instead of the mother. So she's not the legal guardian of her own children. That was something that they could do in historical romance times. So she is under a lot of stress and pressure to try and present a case. Her brother's a barrister to the courts to try and prove that she is a worthy mother to be full guardianship of them. So something that she proceeds to do is find a man so she can have a man in her life so that the courts will think that, you know, this is a very stable home. She can't find anybody who really, uh, she thinks will agree to fake marry her or be a fake husband to her until she thinks about a man she knew before she got married in her coming out years. And that is Nate, who is our lovable rogue. He, uh, ended up owing her a little bit of a debt when she got him out of some trouble early on. And they definitely had a little bit of feelings, nothing like too serious, but there was like some chemistry and stuff there that didn't ever end up happening in for anything because she ended up getting married. So when she comes to him and she's like, Hey, I'm going to call that favor in. I need you to come and pose as my fiance to hopefully win these people over that I will be a, a worthy candidate as guardian for my own children. And he agrees because she's going to financially reward him very wonderfully. So I loved this book. I've talked about it a lot. I talked about it in a vlog. I talked about it on uh, a video about historical romances. But in case you haven't watched any of those and you're just here for the wrap up, I loved this book. I think this is one of the most beautiful historical romances I've ever read. I think it's lovely in pretty much every way. And I just adored it. I adored it so much. And if you're looking for a new historical romance author to try, I would highly recommend her. This is her debut book, but she also has a novella that came out featuring Nate's brother, which I'm going to talk about. Actually, I'll just talk about that right now. Even though I read that, that was the last book that I read at the end of my cutoff for mid-month. So the novella is A Day Until Forever. So this is by the same author, Aaron Langston. I gave this book five out of five stars. This is a novella. It's not too, too short. I feel like this was just a really perfect length for a novella because you got a really good sense of the characters. You had enough plot to keep you interested to see how these two were going to meet up. And I just adored it. I just love this author's writing so much. I think that she's just so... She has such a good way of creating romantic tension and really making you feel like these people are falling in love. Like, I've been missing that so much in romances that are currently being published. I feel like sometimes we skip the falling in love and we just dive headlong into smut, which I absolutely hate. It's not my vibe at all. I want some romance. I want some good old-fashioned romance. And that is what this author delivers. So this book is about Raymond, who is Nate's brother. So Raymond is, I believe he's the Earl. I can't remember the exact title. And he ended up being the guardian to Nate and his sister when Nate's father passed away and the Earl's father passed away. So you do see Raymond in Forever Your Rogue a little bit and he's very like 
very, very stoic, very follow all the rules, very do your duty type of guy. But we get a glimpse in that book that he deeply loves his wife. So this is their romance, him and Rosalie, Raymond and Rosalie. This is how they meet. This is how they fall in love. And I just loved this book so much. They end up meeting. He ends up escorting her to a fair, like an autumn fair that she really wants to go to because Raymond is trying to secure this deal to make his lands, you know, like he's in charge of the earldom and the lands. I think it's an earldom. Again, I apologize if I'm wrong. I'm really bad at remembering titles, but he's trying to make secure a deal so that his farmlands produce more so that he can be a better steward of that land and the people that like he's sort of in charge of. And he's trying to make this deal with Rosalie's father. And the father is like, no, I don't want to make this deal with you. I know who your father is. I know that he's just sending you here to do this stuff. And I don't trust him at all because uh, Raymond's dad is a bit of a deadbeat, which is how one of the ways he heads up sort of raising Nate and his sister. However, the father says, you know what? Actually, I could use your help. Could you chaperone my daughter to this festival? She's got her eye on this guy who I don't want her anywhere near. So I need you to like keep her away from him because she had her coming out late and she really wants to get married and start her life as a mother and a wife. Anyway, Raymond agrees. He escorts Rosalind, Rosalie, Rosalie, Rosalie to the fair, the festival. And it's just so freaking charming. It's so charming, so delightful, so romantic. I just adored it. It was a great time. I I find myself very captivated by this author's writing. I really vibe with how she tells a story, the details she chooses to include, the moments she chooses to emphasize. I just, I just love everything about it. So I gave this one five stars. It was a great quick read. I read it in an evening. It was only like an hour and a half long on, and it is, I think it's on, I think it's on KU. Both of these are on Kindle Unlimited, by the way, if you want to check them out. So if you're looking for new historical romances to try, I'd highly recommend both of those. They're fantastic. Okay, so now this next one I have a little bit of an unpopular opinion of. I apologize. So this is Yours Truly by Abby Jimenez. I read Part of Your World last year, which was my first Abby Jimenez, and I loved it. Loved it so much. I just loved everything about that book. I loved the characters' journeys, the romance, everything. I thought it was perfection. So I had very high expectations for Yours Truly, and I was slightly disappointed. I ended up giving this book three out of five stars. Now, I think that Abby Jimenez is one of the best writers as far as how how she puts her words together and how she chooses to convey emotion with those words. I think she has a great grasp on that. So you're going to get some really good banter. You're going to get some really good insight into the character's points of view and what they're thinking about. I really, really like how she does that. The basic premise of this is Brianna. She's a doctor and she's trying to get it's like chief of the ER, whatever that position is. She's hoping to get that. And in comes Jacob who transfers to this hospital who also works at the ER. And he's kind of this new shining star that looks like he may potentially fit that position better. So there's a tiny a little bit of rivalry there at the beginning, but it's quickly dampened when, you know, Brianna, 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 I don't know how to say her name, when she definitely sees something that he does and she starts softening towards him and she starts feeling a little bit like guilty that maybe she was kind of rude to him and he's new and she didn't like that. So they start writing letters back and forth, leaving little notes at, at the hospital, which was just delightful. I loved that so, so much. I really, truly did. And then we get to see their romance very slowly evolve. There's a fake dating aspect of it. You know, like she comes with a lot of betrayal trauma. Her husband cheated on her and left her. And he is here with a good bit of trauma himself because his ex-girlfriend, I think, I don't know if they were engaged or whatever, left him for his brother. So both of them have a lot of issues. And Jacob has anxiety, which I did feel like was really well represented in here. I really loved seeing that, seeing a hero who felt things and had emotions and was very vulnerable on page. Like, I really, really loved that. The thing that really made this book not work for me, however, were a couple of things. One of them was the the whole time... So another book I'm going to mention later on does the same type of thing, but that book was six stars for me. So there's they're in this fake relationship, but they're both developing feelings for each other, and there's a series of miscommunications that happen where they believe that you know, they they start to think maybe this person does feel things for me and then something happens that they misinterpret or that they overhear wrong that leads them to believe, oh no, actually they're still hung up on their, their ex, you know? And that just happens for the majority of the book, which again, I'm not, a, I'm not, I'm not a hater of miscommunication. I feel like it's very realistic and I'm pretty understanding and I have a pretty fair, fair, high tolerance for misunderstanding in romance because I think it's, it's a staple of romantic relationships in life and in fiction. You're going to miscommunicate 
communicate. It's really hard to communicate with another person, especially when you deeply care about them. So the miscommunication itself wasn't an issue. It was the length of time that the miscommunication lasted. It lasted the majority of the book, and they just kept going back and forth like so much, but not just the back and forth. The thing that really made this not work for me specifically was how it just felt so repetitive. It felt so cyclical. It felt like we were recycling the same thoughts in our characters' heads over and over and over again about how, oh, I don't think they like me. Oh, I don't think that she likes me. I really like him. I really like her. It was just this continuous loop. Nothing was breaking it up. Nothing was pushing the story forward. And we just were stuck there. And that's really what it was because, because we were stuck there and it just kept happening. I got bored and I started losing interest because I'm like, we need something else. We need something else to change, to not necessarily push them together. We need an added dynamic. We can't just keep recycling the same miscommunication over and over again. So I know that's not going to bother a lot of people, but for me, I was just like, it wasn't the miscommunication that bothered me. It was the fact that it was repetitive, constantly, nonstop. And it just, it just was too much. And I lost interest because I was like, we've heard this before. These are, this is literally everything that's been happening. And I understand that maybe that was a device she was using to convey how anxiety affected Jacob. I get that. But it wasn't just on Jacob's part. It was also on Brianna's part. So that really had it at a four star for me for a long time because I'm like, I'm not enjoying this book. Anything that knocks my enjoyment down is going to knock the star rating down a little bit too. Even if it is, even if it is like an author that I really admire, like Abby Jimenez, like I think she's just excellent at her craft. This part specifically didn't work for me. But then we get to the ending, and I really didn't like the ending. The ending is what knocked it down to a three star for me. I didn't like how it sort of came out of nowhere, this additional layer of trauma and plot that I just, it honestly, I, I disliked that so much. I wish that, especially considering the talent that Abby Jimenez is and how experienced she is, she did not need to just throw in a plot device at the very last minute. That needed to be worked into the story. Where was that when we were stuck in that cycle? Where was this element? That would have been interesting, you know? And then that would have been a more effective story. It just really, I hate when plot elements specifically in the third act come out of nowhere. That always is going to dock points for me because in my opinion, anything that feels manufactured, anything that comes in at the last second in as a plot device at that third act conflict, that signals to me lazy writing. I didn't think things through clear enough. I need a third act conflict. This will work, you know, and I just don't like that. That combined with what the third act conflict was, which was something that I, I just wish had been avoided. Not that I personally have a problem with it, but I know that that is triggering for some dear friends of mine, and I just wish that that aspect could be handled with a little more care. So I do have all of the trigger warnings on my Goodreads review, which will tell you what that is if you want to know, but I'm not going to mention it here. So, all right, three stars for that one, and I was disappointed. That was one of my most anticipated books of the year. Very sad about that. Okay, so now the next book that I read was Grimm and Barrett by Juliet Cross. This is the last book in the Stay a Spell series. This is a paranormal romance series that I dearly, dearly love. I love this series so much. It's just so comforting to me. I feel like these have small town romance feels, magical, mystical, um, paranormal vibes. This has such wonderful, swoony, sweet romances, which I just adore. And they also have a really good element of suspense woven in there. And I just also just really love Juliet's writing. I think that she has a really good grasp on developing characters and creating moments where they can really shine in their romantic development through the progression of the story. And this one I think worked especially well because Clara and Henry, Clara is a witch, one of the Savoie sisters. Henry is a grim reaper. We've seen them circling each other through previous books, like the whole series through. Like, we knew this was coming. So they do get together quite early on in the book. I think by like 30% they're together, which I think a lot of readers will like, but I know some readers will not. I actually really loved it because you saw the buildup happen in the previous books. So I liked getting a chance to see them finally get together and have a little bit more of happiness while they're sort of working things out. But the thing that this book did that really surprised me, there's a plot element in here that did surprise me, but it wasn't like a contrived relationship breaker. It was plot things. I wasn't expecting that to happen. It devastated me. I was like shocked. And I loved, loved, loved how our hero just absolutely was going to burn the world down to get his heroin back. Like, I just loved it so much. So I loved this book. I gave it five stars. I loved the romance. I'm so sad the series is over, but I'm very excited to be able to reread it. And I, I, I highly recommend the series. If you're looking for anything sweet, swoony, 
cozy with just like really fun family, found family. Like I just can't recommend this series enough. It's finished now, so you can pick it up and uh, they're well worth your time, I promise. All right, and then we have a book that I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about, and that is Fourth Wing. You've probably seen this everywhere. It's blown up TikTok, and I think also Instagram as well. And if you, like myself, were kind of um, excited about this book, but you were also a little bit wary because of all of the rave reviews, then uh, maybe I will be able to provide a little bit of clarity because I didn't like this book. I gave it two stars. Originally, I gave this book three stars. Like, I rated it 2.5 and rounded it up to 3 because a two-star book for me is something that I just really didn't enjoy. But, you know, the more time that has passed since I read this, I did vlog about it fully, so if you want all of my thoughts, which I go into a lot of detail, I go into a lot of detail about why this specific book didn't work for me personally, you, you know, go watch that video. But, yeah, I didn't like this book. The more I thought about it, the more I'm like, that's definitely not a three-star book. A three-star book is a book that I like and that I'll still recommend. You know, a lot of times I'll rate a book three stars and I'll have some very specific issues with the book. Some, uh, most of the time they're structural that I feel like are easier to tolerate for other people. But for me, they are kind of like a roadblock, you know? <sighs> But I really didn't enjoy this book pretty much at all. I started out really hopeful, really hopeful I was going to like it. This book is a new adult fantasy romance. The heroine is 20, the hero is 23. But it truly reads like they're 12. Like, this is one of the most juvenile read sounding books that I've read in a really long time. And I just find myself so disappointed with that. You know, like, I actually really love YA. And something that is kind of a pet peeve of mine is the the comment that I hear from some people that YA feels too, you know, it's too young. I'm not interested in reading, like, you know, young. But there are so many beautifully told YA stories that are not necessarily juvenile sounding. They capture that feeling of innocence and that cusp of adulthood just really, really well. That coming of age story that I think is beautiful and transcends like age. That's something that you can connect with depending on how the writer uses the voice, the character's voice and their arthurial voice. But this book, oh my gosh, this book just frustrated the heck out of me. <laughs> it's, 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 it's a weekly told story. There really is no story here. This is about Violet who goes to Dragon Rider Academy and that's the basic of the plot. There, there really isn't even a plot to tell you. I don't know why Dragon School even exists. I don't know why the dragons even want to be in this partnership with humans, which I feel like really should have been explained. I don't know why this world needs dragon riders. Like, what, what is, why is this so important? You know, all of those basic questions that you should have an answer to, or that you should at least have an inkling of why when you start reading this, they weren't there. They were never answered. And it just instead became this setup, this very manufactured setup for our heroine to go in there and have some like relationship with this guy who just like their romance was so cringy, y'all. Like it was literally, I just, I don't know. I don't want to rant about it because here's the thing. <clears throat> A book like this is such an interesting experience because Clearly, it's doing some things right, because a lot of people really enjoyed it. But that doesn't mean that it's without flaw, and that doesn't mean that everyone's going to love it, you know? I mean, like I've said a million times, every single book has flaws. It just depends on what your own personal tolerance is for, are you going to be able to look past those flaws? Are you even going to notice those flaws? There's nothing wrong with that if you don't notice them, right? Like, that's the goal, is to not notice the flaws. And for other people, they're really going to see those right away. Like, it's the whole act of a magician creating an illusion. Like, I talked about this in my blog. I'm sorry, I'm going off on a tangent on this book. So, I, I think that when a book like this gets so incredibly popular, it is doing something right. It has reached its target audience. And that is a lot of good points to the marketing team for that. They knew what their target audience was, and they hit it. And I think that's wonderful. And honestly, any time that any book sees a bunch of popularity like this, I think that's amazing. It just didn't work for me, you know? And I, I'm i going to quote Mari, who on TikTok did a really great review of this. And she's like, before anybody comes at me and says, this book isn't for you, she's like, it is for me. I love fantasy. I love romance. I love dragons. I too love all of those things. I love fantasy. I love dragons. I love romance. So if this book isn't for me, then who is it for, right? 
tell me who it's for. Again, I'm paraphrasing Mari from My Name is Marinas. I will have her TikTok link down below if you want to watch her review. It's really quite entertaining. If you loved the book, maybe don't watch it because it's a very critical review. But yeah, I just, I think that I've, I've seen, like, already I've seen a lot of people have, like, very strong feelings about, like, um, you didn't like this book? Well, I loved it. And, you know, it, it like, get very defensive. And, like, this is, this is my channel. Here's the thing. This is my channel. This is where I'm going to talk about books. I'm going to tell you exactly how I felt about the books, okay? And this isn't me saying that if you liked it, there's something wrong with you or that I'm smarter than you or anything like that. I'm not saying that at all. I am telling you how my brain is processing this book as I'm reading it. So if you take that personally, that's not my fault, okay? Anyway, anyway. I love y'all. Thank you so much for watching. And I'm sure that um, hopefully you know that I can be harsh, but that's the way my brain works when I'm reading. So anyway, moving right along, two stars for that one. Okay, so now the next book that I read is Soft Flannel Hank, which is a contemporary slash paranormal romance. I think this is a light paranormal romance. I loved this book so freaking much. I also vlogged this in my fourth wing vlog. So if you want my full thoughts on this where I gush about it, you're, you know, go watch that fast forward through fourth wing if you don't want to see that part. But this is basically a reimagined story of Charlie Swan from Twilight who gets his happily ever after. I love that the author is donating a percent of the pro profits of this book to, I'm not entirely sure which organization she's donating it to, but it will benefit indigenous people in their lands because this part of this book does take place on the Quileut lands. So I love that. And uh, I just loved this. It's about Hank. And a lot of this book is, you know, if you like Twilight, if you knew Twilight, you'll see a lot of nods to Charlie Swan. His name is Hank Dove. It's basically, he's a 45 year old man. He's divorced. He's really down on his luck. He is very depressed. He's really struggling with a lot of heartbreak from when his wife left him. And he's just trying to he's really just existing. And then he meets this woman, Esther, at a cafe who is a witch. And they meet eyes across the room and they have a one night stand and suddenly he feels like he could live and not just exist. And it's just so beautiful. I loved this romance. He is one of the best heroes I've ever read about. He is so expertly executed and he's so sensitive and you just really get a good glimpse of who he is. You understand who he is and how he feels and how that impacts his actions. And I think you do for Esther as well. There is a little bit of a paranormal romance plot in here, which is really what drives the two of them together and apart at times. And I thought that was interesting. I really, really just truly enjoyed this. And if you're looking for something that is really sweetly romantic, that has some very real feeling people with characters who are maybe a little bit older, like he's 45 and she's 35. I just would highly recommend this. I thought it was fantastic. I gave this six stars, another all-time favorite read of the year. So I loved it. Okay. And then I read, I've walked where you've been by Marina Vivancos. So I'm not going to really talk about what this is or my rating because this is going to be included in a vlog. I am doing a collaboration vlog that will be out next I think two weeks, two weeks. The end of May is when this comes out. So I read this to try and get a jump on it and start filming it. And the basic premise of this is it's a novella. It's MM and it's a soulmate type of novella. So you'll have to wait for my final thoughts on that. But I wanted to mention at least that I read it. Okay, and then the last book that I read that I want to talk about is Venetia by Georgette Hayer. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing her name right. So this author is one that I've been hearing about for some time. I feel like a lot of people talk about her, pretty much they're divided on two sides. Like some people say that she's like the creator of Regency romance as we know it today, that she writes true historical romances and, you know, like she's the standard. And other people say, you know, well, there's no sex in it. And Georgia Hare, if, you know, she's not as great as everybody says she is. So... I have really been curious to read her, and I wasn't sure what exactly I was going to think about this book, so I ended up listening to this on audio. I got the audio from my library. Now, I did not realize that this was abridged. The audio version I listened to was abridged until I was, like, halfway through it, so at that point, I was like, I'm going to just go ahead and continue on. Um, I was like, geez, this is a short book. It's only, like, a almost a five-hour audiobook, but it's narrated by Richard Armitage, which was... 10 out of 10, like that enhanced my reading experience of this so much. And I was just like, I'm not going to stop r listening to Richard Armitage. So I do want to go back at some point and reread this in print form. They're going to, Sourcebooks is actually going to be re-releasing this this fall. 
and I love the cover, so I'm going to be buying that, and then I think I will reread it in print form at that time. But I ended up giving this book five stars for what I read of it, and I do think that part of that is probably how much I loved Richard Armitage narrating it to me. But also, this was just a very engaging, very fun, very unique, and very well-told story. So this basic plot is about Venetia. She is our heroine. She's 25 years old. She is known for her incredible beauty. She ends up inheriting this estate, and she has to go to the country, basically, with her brother, who is uh, described as being an invalid of some sort. So she ends up going there to take care of him, and she has only had, like, two men who have been, like, courting her, or two suitors, and she's not interested in either of them at all. She's determined to only marry for love, and she is going to wait until that happens, you know, and since she is 25, she's on, like, the pretty much on the shelf, about to be declared a spinster, but she's, you know, she's not gonna just marry anybody, she's gonna marry for love. So one day she has this chance meeting with her neighbor, Lord Demerel, who is known as a rake and a blackguard, basically. Like, uh, his reputation precedes him. He has a terrible reputation because he is a rake, a rogue, a scoundrel, but not in, like, any type of charming way. Like, literally, his reputation is so bad that if he is in any type of association with Venetia, he will effectively ruin her, which I think is kind of a, a rarity, you know, in the historical romances that we read today. So, of course, the two end up falling in love, but it's a very gradual sort of falling in love, where at first they're just, like, sort of uneasy friends, and then that really, you get to see them truly develop this friendship into a love, and I just loved it. I mean, this this feels like the Reformed Rake origin story, but the twist is that he doesn't ever technically reform. Like, at the end, the way this book ends, you know that he loves Venetia, and you also know that she loves and accepts him for who he is, and she's not asking him to change, she's not asking him to be somebody that he's not, but you know that they love each other, and you have the promise of a happily ever after for them. So I felt like this was, even though this was like published, I think, in like 1958, I felt like this read very fresh and very unique and very different from a lot of the historicals that we see nowadays, you know? obviously there's no, there is no steam in this book. It was actually illegal at this time for there to be sex on the page for, you know, for women at this time. So I found this to just be very enjoyable. I really felt like the characters were well developed. I really, really loved any time that Lord Demerel and Venetia were on page together. I thought that the the dialogue was very witty and sharp. I really liked her writing style. And again, I, because I know I read the I listened to and read the abridged version. I'm really curious what the full version is going to feel like. So I was so tempted to buy a copy and just read it right now, but I really want this cover. So I'm going to wait until the fall and then buy it and read it. But yeah, this was definitely worth my time. I enjoyed this immensely. I felt like this was also full of everything that I want in fiction, which had a lot of subtleties with the characters, a lot of different interaction with other side characters that really lend insight into who these characters are and how they're thinking, and I liked the plot twist added at the end, and I just loved, honestly, I was living for every interaction between Venetia and Lord Demerel. Like, it was just fantastic. I loved, I loved watching this man, who is the epitome of a rake, just fall in love with her. It was fantastic. I really, really enjoyed it. So, yeah, this one was definitely worth my time, and if you have access to the Richard Armitage audio, audio version, like, I would highly recommend it. It was fantastic. It's a short, I mean, because it's abridged, it's only four hours, but it was well worth, well worth my read. I enjoyed this a lot. This one was picked for me by Chris for my 12 Reads from 12 Friends challenge that I'm doing this year, and yeah, I loved it. I really loved it, so five stars for this one. So, all right, my friends, there you have it. Those are the books that I have read so far this month. I hope you all enjoyed this video. Thank you so much for watching. If you have made it this far, please feel free to leave me a dog emoji. There's a dog groomers right over there. I just keep seeing dogs walk in. Anyway, thanks so much, my friends. I'll see you all in my next video.